Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Designers at Home. I'm Mark Weaver. So I hope everybody's had a great week. Um, I got my second COVID shot yesterday. I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to feel this morning, but I feel great, and I'm thrilled that all of you are joining us. So today, is, is we're going to do something a little different. Um, we've interviewed, you know, over the last year, some really fascinating people um, from all aspects of design. And I've had um, a lot of people say, Mark, why don't you get on and talk about the way you work in your office and how you work as a team? So this morning, we've got a, a very special guest, my associate, Daryl Wilson, and we're going to talk about how we collaborate in design and our views on design. So Daryl's going to join us now. Um, Daryl comes from an architectural background. He got his master's um, in architecture at Princeton, and there he is. Hi, Daryl. Hi there. Good it's morning, so funny Mark. to see you here and not at the office. It is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> but in an hour, we'll see each, each other at the it's office. It's true. So. Very busy day. <laughs> anyway, um, I was just starting to give them a little bit of background about your education, but I think, um, I think you could probably do a better job of that than I can. So... Um, you know, Daryl, you and I both came from rather modest, a modest background. So how did you get from St. Petersburg to Princeton? You know, I, you know, I was very fortunate because my mother was a very creative woman and was always a, making clothes and doing things for herself. And I watched that and my stepfather was in construction. So I always wanted to be somehow involved in architecture or interior design, something really creative. And I, you know, I sort of was one of those kids that was involved in everything. And I, I did lots of stuff, lots of art projects. And the guys from the recruiters from Princeton came around and I applied and I got in. It, it was, it was pretty wonderful. And, you know, worked with my parents and all that to do as much as we could along with grants and all that and ended up doing undergraduate and graduate in architecture there. So, and who were some of your professors? Were there any notable architects? Oh yes. Yeah. So at the time, my undergraduate thesis advisor was Michael Graves. Oh, so wow. I was attending um, Princeton at the height of postmodernism. Uh -huh. Which gets a bad rap, but what I think postmodernism did for me, at least, is allowed me to look at things in a way that had more of a humanistic touch. So where people could actually occupy the space and come in, and so it had a little bit more relevance and not be cold and just and sort of machine-like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so, and how long how long were you in New York working? So after graduate school, so after I got my undergraduate degree in architecture, uh, a bachelor's, and then I got a master's of architecture, then I moved to New York um, in 1984. Uh, it was an exciting time to be in New York. Um, it wasn't the New York that we know now. And a lot of stuff was growing and, you know, changing. And I was in New York from 84 to 96, so I was able to witness like all the the sort of structures and the the areas of Manhattan opening up and 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 buildings, it was really exciting. And um, you you then you decided to change directions a little bit. Well, so, I, as, <laughs> well, as I call it, it's my early midlife crisis. Um, <laughs> so, in '96, I, I'd always done art projects and take painting classes and tapped into that creative side of, you know, architecture and interiors. Uh -huh. um, and at the time, I had shifted over from working from an architecture to an interior. So I was, I was trying to get a better feel of the expanse of the, the creative possibilities mm -hmm. for, you know, building and living. So I decided I wanted to go back to art school and get a master's of fine arts. And that's what brought me to Los Angeles. And uh, why Los Angeles? What was appealing about Los Angeles to you? Oh, Los Angeles. At the time, the, 
art scene in Los Angeles was very dynamic and very mm -hmm. accessible. So I, you know, was able to have, you know, all the notable professors from Larry Pittman, you know, to others that came to reviews. And it was just such a dynamic environment to be here and be amongst people who are really being creative. And, you know, some of my classmates have gone on to be in the Biennale, you know, so they're, they're really, it was really a high level of creativity and thought. So, so did, was, did you think that, um, or were you pleased with the move um, to Los Angeles and, and the change of direction? Well, the initially moving to Los Angeles was a little, it was a little challenging. Uh -huh. You know, it was in a new place. I quit my job. Um, I was working, you know, at a, a very, you know, sort of well-known interior design firm at part-time while I went to school. And it was exciting because it exposed me more to, um, you know, it was Sally Serkin Lewis and she had both an interior design ser um, service as well as the manufacturing. And at the time, the offices were down at the factory. So it, it, it introduced me to another level of craftsmanship. Design, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, so, and, you know, that, that was really, really interesting and fascinating. And it took me a couple of years to get used to New York, to Los Angeles, but it grew on me because you have so much more access to creative people, landscape, different influences, plus the weather's nice. Yeah, the weather is very nice. Yeah. Especially so, right now more, when you think what's happening in the East and we're all complaining about 65 degree weather here. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> you Mark, your, your background, you, you did a lot of, of the decorative arts. You know, how did that influence you in, you know, how you made your career? Well, um, I think unlike you, I was a little lost at, at a younger age. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And you know, Daryl, I had applied to two colleges for architecture because I had met an architect in town that um, my family knew. And I was really sort of um, interested and intrigued by what he did. And, um, but I wasn't accepted at either college and, um, and I had talked to a friend of mine who had gone to an interior design college in Los Angeles. So I applied and was accepted. And that's how I got into the interior design field. And um, two years later, I found out that my school had sent out the wrong transcripts, which was why I was not accepted into architecture. So one of the reasons, um, you know, one of the things somebody has asked me, let's talk about how you guys work together. Well, I think one of the reasons we work so well together is that, you know, I have an incredible passion for architecture, as do you. And we both have a great knowledge of design and history and history of design. So, um, you know, I don't have the, the architectural skills that you do. Your, your skills are remarkable and I, got, I have such respect for them. But, but I do carry the same passion that you do for architecture. And in our business, architecture and, and interior design go hand in hand. They are essential to one another. You know, so, um, but anyway, I started in design and um, I immediately loved what I was doing. And after the first year of school, I got a job in the field and then I went to work for a designer and I knew that this is where I was gonna be, so. It's been, um, I've been very fortunate to be in um, a career that I love and just feels so natural to me. I, 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 I totally agree with you, you know, yes. and I think one of the things we really do share is both that passion for architecture and that passion for design. Because, you know, you know we, have, we have different influences. You're a bit more of a neoclassicist. I'm a little bit more of a modernist. But I think that helps us look at each project with sort of fresh eyes in how we've worked together because it's very collaborative. It's very, you know, it's very interactive. One of the things that I found working in architecture when I was in New York is that architects can be a little 
rigid at rigid. times. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, a, a little bit more concern about what it looks like and, you know, the formality and so forth. And this came up once when I was um, working for an architecture, you know, office. And I got, I was responsible for bringing in the flowers. And one day I brought in some flowers and they say, oh, that's too decoratory. And it was like, what, <laughs> what does that even mean? You know, it's, and what I found it, it, they were missing was there's a whole nother layer without, you know, going to being overly decorative that makes it more human, that makes it more livable. Well, I think yeah. that's what designers do to a project. I mean, um, if something does get too structured and too rigid, um, in many cases, it's unlivable. It's cold. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think what a good designer brings to a project, they bring the magic and the romance. And, and they bring um, their talents that um, make the place come alive and make it livable and make it a home. Yes. And so there's a, a fine line between designing something that's so stunning it looks like a showroom and making it somebody's home. And I think you and I, um, as much as, as perfectionists as we are, um, <laughs> we understand that there have to be elements of, of our clients in the home, things that they like, photographs and memorabilia, perhaps family heirlooms. And we may not like them, but we, we understand how important that is uh, to incorporate that into our clients' homes. Well, and it's also, you know, and we've experienced this on several projects where, you know, you go, how do you, how do you really go into this room? Where is the bed wall? There's a door here. There's a window there. There's, you know, people live and they have stuff, you know, even the minimalists do. So right. how do you make it all work, you know? So um, what... What do you think makes a successful design practice? What do you think makes us unique, Daryl? For, for those of you that don't know, Daryl and I have worked together for over 21 years. Daryl's uh, always joking that we're like an old married couple. So we argue with one another, we poke fun at one another, we collaborate on great ideas, um, and we try and make this process um, as enjoyable as we can, even through the stressful periods. But um, it's, I have to say, Daryl, it's so great to have somebody to collaborate with, to bounce ideas off of, to support. And, and I can go to you and say, Daryl, what do you think of this? And you'll give me an honest opinion. Sometimes I don't want to hear it, but, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's but at no least different. I know you're telling the truth. Well, it's no different than, you know, if I'm sitting there drafting and designing something and detailing something, you'll look over my shoulders and go like, well, what's that? Now, part of it, and a lot of times it's in it, it and this is one of the things I learned from being in art, being in a painting class, really, where at one point the, the, it was really the point was you need to look at it from a different perspective. If you're going to make something really wonderful, you need to be able to sort of, step a little bit to the left, the right, and see if it works. And I think that was a metaphor for how we approach things and how, you know, you and I will look at, we'll walk into a space and we'll go, oh, that door should be here. This, you know, this should be different furniture. And I think that's all part of the creative process. Yeah, yeah it is. I mean, it's great. Um, I know when we first start a project, you and I will walk through a place and, um, and I'm sure this comes from um, how many years we've worked together because we'll look at the space, we'll immediately know what's wrong with it. The doorways are in the wrong place. The windows are too small. There's not enough natural light in a room. The crown moldings are wrong. Um, the fireplace is, is incorrectly done. Whatever it is that's wrong with the room. And then um, from there, we talk about what is the client trying to achieve in this space. And, and so, that's something that I think just comes from the gut. It's just at this point, after doing this for so many years, it's just something you know and understand. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's, you know, it's one of those things, you know, and I think of one of the projects, you know, that we worked on where the client wanted to turn basically a very large ranch house into something that looked like the south of France. And we both walked in, you know, you met with her initially and was like, 
that's not really possible, but we can make it Spanish colonial very easily. Right, right. So it's that ability to look at something and go, well, it's not really this. And that was a really wonderful experience working with a client to, 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 to really have this evolve. Yeah, that was a, that particular project was, was pure magic, Daryl. Um, first of all, to get a client that has a vision that you can just throw out idea after idea and they just, they're, their level of enthusiasm is greater than ours and they love it. They want you to develop it and see. And this is a project that you and I worked on for five years. Yes. And, um, and I have to say that um, we had an architect on the project, but most of the interior detailing and interior architecture um, you did. Yeah. And when you go through this house and you see the attention to detail, um, it's remarkable. And that's really your brilliance, Daryl. That's what you bring. And, um, and the clients, when they see it completed, clients are always complaining, oh, it's going to cost too much money. To, but when they see it and they see the completed results, they love it and they understand it. And, you know, that goes for um, how window coverings are going to be designed into a space. Do we create hidden soffits for window shades to come down to protect things from the sun? Um, where are vents located? Where are thermostats located? How are the ceiling details done? How do we light rooms without just a sea of down lights on the ceiling? That's one of, I know you and I, have, it's one of our pet peeves is to go into a room and look up at the ceiling and it looks like Swiss cheese. There's right. so many more creative ways to light a room without destroying the ceilings. So, and I think that, you know, you know we're, we're talking about um, the Sanger residence and winery and Sandy and Nets. Yes. And one of the wonderful things about that property is that as you walk in this house, you walk in and they're, you know, I believe they're 15th, no, five, fifth century mosaics. Yes. You know, that flank, uh, you know, the walls, and then there's a beautiful glass floor that looks down to the wine cave. You know, the wine cave was something we totally created but it's all veneered in, you know, Santa Barbara stone, and it has this rich, wonderful, you know, feeling to it as you walk into the house. And I think that's, yeah. I think that's one of the things in terms of the interplay between, I wouldn't say decorative, but, you know, the, the more decorative parts of the house and the architecture of the house. Yeah, well, the, it wasn't an important house architecturally, but now it makes quite a statement and it's rather impressive. And yeah. the thing that, um, that was really fun about this, we got to create magical areas. This is like being at a resort. There are several patios around the house to, um, for entertaining. So uh, the clients at sunset like to go on one of the um, inner patios where it's protected from the breezes and they watch the light change on the mountains. If yeah. you're out at the pool, it's a completely different view. Um, there's a small lake on the property and we put, um, we put a platform on the lake so an orchestra could play when they entertain. Um, there's a tower on the water tower on the property. Remember that thing, how hideous it was, Daryl? It, it was, was, it was just, just a hideous water tower. Yeah, it was just an eyesore stuck right um, adjacent to the house. And we redesigned this, we put a vine on it to soften it, and we made it a lookout tower. And um, they use it for um, going up and watching the sun and overlooking the property. And you can go up there and sit and have a glass of wine. So this sort of um, lemon on the property really turned out to be a little jewel. Well, and that, that little jewel is, you know, it has decorative ironwork that's really beautiful. It has this beautiful Moroccan tile. So it, it all, it, it's about taking something that was existing and really making it a, 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 a showpiece. Right. That was really fun. Although I got to say my, my favorite part of that house, well, maybe it's not my favorite, is the, is the master bathroom. Because well, the that's, master yes. Yeah. Yes. You, you outdid yourself on that one. Yeah. Um, I think I think Bill almost had a heart attack when he was getting the bills, but then when he saw it, he said, "Oh my God, 
this is just pure genius. The details that are in the shower inlaid with um, mosaics and onyx, and there's cove lighting inside behind a, a hand-carved onyx crown mold. I mean, it's just, it's breathtaking. Right. And this yeah. all started with, you know, Jan saw that tub and she thought she had to have that tub. It's this, it's this beautiful tub that's carved out of one block of onyx. It's, yeah. it's a one of a kind piece. Right. Right. Yeah. So Daryl, um, a couple people have asked me, they said, you guys are such perfectionists and detail oriented. How are you guys handling um, your projects, which are all over the place? in terms of COVID because, um, you know, we don't have the luxury of being at these jobs every day and overseeing construction and the design development. So we have, we, we currently have um, uh, a couple projects in Nantucket. We have two in Miami. Um, we've just completed um, some offices in London. And um, we have, I think we have two projects right now in Montecito and we're gonna have three more starting before the end of the year yeah. there. So um, how, how successful do you think um, Zoom meetings and working with, because this is something that you handle more than I do. How, do you, how successful do you think these Zoom meetings are with construction crews and the architects? Well, you know, the one thing, you know, even during COVID, you know, I've made visits to job sites. It's not weekly, it's maybe monthly. You know, the Zoom meetings are, they're necessary in this time mm -hmm. because you need that weekly communication to say, what's happening? What are our expectations? Oh, this is different. It, you know, the whole, the whole process of executing a job, for, you know, after you've had all your like creative, there are always things that come up that you have to resolve. So the Zoom meetings are very helpful, but they don't replace being there. You know, we're, we're working with Wade Weissman's office on one of the projects and the project architect and I often will spend two hours on a Zoom call talking about the details for certain areas, you know, and in a way, I think in the past it wouldn't have been as collaborative, you know, because you right. know, he'd done something and sent it to us and said, hey, that's it, you know, uh, not necessarily that blunt, but it's, it's one of those things where it has provided an opportunity where the Zoom calls do make things easier, even though they take in a way more time because, you know, normally you would just say, oh, okay, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll meet, you know, you know, in person, and we'll just go through this really quickly. So on the offices that we did in London, um, I still haven't seen them completed. Now, you went over and you installed this and you were there on numerous visits. So um, tell us about the team of people that we had, because they were highly supportive and they were very um, instrumental in um, that being a successful project. Well, I think this also taps into the how different construction firms work. So that the, the London project was one where they were sort of design build, you know, even though we had the template for them, they basically came over, they did all the documentation for applying to all the, the, the bureaucracy of London and they really handled that. And Zoom calls, site visits, you know, to go through the details of stuff. And that was really wonderful because, uh, you know, some of the minutia that you would work with typically with an architect um, or a construction company, because were, in the States they're separate, they dealt with in hand. So, uh, you know, you didn't have to have the architects tell someone else to say, here in the States, it's very different because typically there's an architect and then there's a contractor. And, you know, one of the things that you, the two of us also very strongly believe in is you have to have a good contractor. You yeah, know, it's because essential. we've had experiences where clients have had architects, great architects, great us, you know, and then we get to the execution with the contractor and it's, it, it's, 
we have to all be a team. We all have to be supportive of each other. And that right. is what makes the project successful. Yeah, there can't be a weak link in there or it's, it makes the project tough and yeah. you're always correcting things. You know, um, it made me think of, we've done five residences on the ship, the world. Yeah. And um, it's, you know, it, people say, well, how do you do that when the ship is constantly traveling? Well, it's no different than if we're doing a job in LA or Santa Barbara or New York or, or London. Um, you prepare everything, you design everything, and you work with a team of people. And on that particular project, I remember I flew to New Zealand to meet the contractor and the contracting firm was out of Geneva and was highly recommended by the ship and several people on the ship who had used this company. And I went through um, just talking to um, the head engineer um, from the firm and telling him about what I wanted to do and um, went home. And two weeks later, I got a package um, outlining in detail every single thing that I had told him. And he didn't write down, now I can't remember what I had for dinner last night. He wrote, he mentally remembered every single detail and nuance that I had mentioned to him. And it yeah. was in writing and in a contract. And that job turned out so perfectly and was such a dream to work on yes. because we had the, the support. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why um, your, your background in architecture is so successful to our firm is that um, you're able to talk to contractors um, and speak their language where a lot of decorators can't. If you can come up with solutions for things that a lot of designers aren't able to. So, you know, I think that's, that's the strength of both of us in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, being able to, you have to be able to think on your feet. Because again, inevitably, there's going to be something that comes up that's not the way you thought it would be. And that, in a way, is part of what enriches a project. Yeah. Yeah. So what, do you, what is the most satisfying thing about a project to you? I think we probably have, we might have a different answer, each of us. Oh, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, when, when, I'm in process when you're going to the job sites, when you're doing the installation, you know, when you're trying to get rid of a Jill floor lamp, which is, you know, <laughs> that's an old joke. <laughs> so it's when, the, you know, the most exciting part for me is when the client comes in and they see it for the first time. So yeah. the, the months, years sometimes of, you know, spending days looking at, you know, going to stone yards, looking at, you know, a gazillion different, you know, limestones or onyxes, you know, with the client, you know, or taking them out shopping with fabric. All of that really is part of the process. It's very exciting. But when it's all pulled together and that's that last little minute before they come in, you're anxious, are they going to like it, whatever, because we have a vision of what we think this is going to be. Right. It certainly evolves as we go along. Mm -hmm. But the client, has, the client has separate pieces. Oh, that chair, I really like that chair. Oh, that stone, I really like that. But when you walk in, there's that, that I, now that's my thrill, that, that excitement that the client comes in and is like, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you what know, on, you? on the San Inez project, I remember when um, we had uh, Jan and Bill come out uh, after we had finally completed this and we had them arrive at a specific time. It was in the late afternoon when the sun was perfect and they pulled up to the front and we greeted them at the front door with a glass of champagne. And um, we had a pianist playing their favorite music and they came in and I'll never forget Jan just kind of dropping her purse and looking around with her mouth open and Bill turned the corner and was wiping his eyes with tears in it. And then he turned to you and I and he said, well, guys, now I know where all my money went. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they were yeah. so thrilled and, and it, that's so great. It's so, so rewarding when that happens. Yeah, it's, it's so rewarding. Thrilling. Yeah. So I think I, I would answer that the same. I mean, for me, that's the, the biggest thrill to make a client happy and to just give them something that is life changing. 
Yeah. So, so Daryl, you and I both share um, avid passion for travel. And, you know, um, we're constantly with projects. We're kind of constantly searching for the rare and unusual. Um, we don't just go out and buy things necessarily out of showrooms. We'll design a lot of our own custom pieces. We'll be influenced by an antique Royer piece or Ruhlmann or something. And um, so travel is a big inspiration to both of us. Yes. And for me, it's, it's really changed my life. Um, it's exposed me to so much um, that I, you know, if I hadn't traveled, I, I wouldn't know about. Yeah, I would say the same thing for me. I was, I was very fortunate as a kid to go to Europe when I was mm -hmm. 12 or 13. You know, and I was in a boys' choir, and it it really opened my eyes up, and the, like there's a whole nother world out there, you know, that mm -hmm. you you know to experience, and it wasn't just visually; it was culturally. You know, I I remember the the first time as an adult that I went, I was in Venice, and I walked through, and being in architecture school, you study a lot about architecture and. You get all the, you know, you get all the images, the slideshows, you know, the lectures, but there's nothing like walking into a space or walking into a city and seeing, you know, the Venice canals or seeing, you know, one a Palladian church or a building yeah. or any of those things. It, it's it's life changing. Yeah, you smell it, you feel it, you touch it, you feel the energy. It's remarkable. Yeah. Um, and uh, so when this whole COVID thing is over, where, where would you like to travel? Where's, what's oh, going to be your next trip? I don't know. I mean, so the, the last trip I took, you know, for fun was to, you know, Israel and Jordan, which right. was phenomenally just life-changing in terms right. of seeing, you know, and being there and seeing a lot of, you know, you forget that the Romans were everywhere, so they're ruined right. everywhere. And right. some very well intact ruins in the middle of functioning cities. It's just, I, I find it amazing. So I don't, I mean, where would I go? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I really want to go back to Paris. You know, because I, I mean, I feel like Paris is one of those places that you can never get enough of, you know, in terms of the architectural history, the art history, there's just so much there. And this goes back to the art of being in the museum where there's the water lily room, where there's right. a special room that's, and it, you, you can't, you know, I'd seen parts of it at MoMA but to be in that room was so phenomenal with it surrounding you, you know. So maybe Paris. Okay, so our associate Antonio just, he's Brazilian. He just put up on the screen Brazil. I think you <laughs> might be a little partial Antonio, but I, need, I don't think either of us has been to Brazil. No, no. No. Although I love South America. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think after being cooped up for the last year, I'm ready for something tropical. I'm ready for a trip to Tahiti, I think. And then as always, I can't wait to get back to Italy again. So, yeah. um, you know, Daryl, you're, I, I always tell everybody, you're so charming and you're so articulate and you're so good at this. I think we need to have you as a host on Designers at Home in the next few weeks. I think it's time I for you to do a couple of these. Yeah. How about yeah. that? That would be awesome. All right, yeah. good. And again, then it'll bring another and a fresh perspective to the program. Yeah. So I think it's good. So our time is about up. I hope you guys have, have enjoyed listening to Daryl and I go back and forth. And um, now, Daryl, it's back to reality. We have to go to the office and, and get busy. But, you know, um, I want to thank you, Daryl, for coming on and, and being the guest. And I also want to take a minute to say how, how privileged I feel to have you um, not as a business colleague, but also as a friend and somebody that I can rely on, I can trust. Um, and it's, it's so rare in life, I think, that you connect with people and have a friendship. But to have 
also have a working relationship is so rare. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say, I have to say the same. You know, one of the things that for me in life is always, you know, you, you want, I want to be around people who enrich my life, you know, and bring, bring something nurturing and joyful to my life. And I so appreciate working with you, having you as my friend, because that really is what makes this all so enjoyable. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and that's the kind of atmosphere we try and have in our office. So, um, and, and it's what we try and, um, you know, show our clients. So it's, yeah. it's great. Anyway, yeah. thank you, Daryl. Have thank a great you. weekend. And okay. thank you everyone for joining us in two weeks on our next um, uh, Designers at Home. We have a guest, but we'll be announcing the guest coming up in the next week. And we hope you'll join us for that. And thank you, Daryl. Goodbye. And goodbye, um, goodbye from Designers at Home.